This morning, what we're going to do is we're going to jump straight into the Word. We're going to continue in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. We just finished a little mini-series on boss ladies, and we looked at how the ministry of Jesus is picking up, uh, picking up steam, and crowds are starting to follow him everywhere, and the crowds are getting bigger, and Jesus has been ministering to the people uh, using, using, um, using experience explicit teaching, calling people to places where he would demonstrate something by healing, by uh, raising someone from the dead, by healing someone else. And he's doing miracles in everybody's midst and everybody's being taught that way. And he's, he's describing different things. And now he's going to step into a new teaching method. He's going to use parables. Parables are stories that tell a spiritual truth. And he's going to use parables. And, and today is the first of the parables that we're going to be looking at. And fortunately, Jesus makes this one easy for us because he describes the meaning of the parable. And so we're going to look at this parable. It's oftentimes called the parable of the sower. Sometimes it's called the parable of the seed. Sometimes it's called the parable of the soils. And really, you can look at it any of those ways because all three of those things are absolutely critical to what God wants us to learn through this parable that he shares with his followers today. But if you find yourself to be a, a kinesthetic learner, a visual learner, or an auditory learner, Jesus is your man because he is teaching them in every way possible. So Wayne, could you please come up with me and, and read this passage for us? Now today, what you're going to do is you're going to join us, I believe, on verse 11. So go ahead and stand to your feet out of reverence for the word. And um, at the top of the screen, it'll say, all read together, and that's when you read. So uh, Wayne will carry us till there and pray for us. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe it for a while and in time of testing fall away. And as for all what fell among the thorns, They are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the world, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time to hear your word, to hear the preaching of our pastor, We pray that you would give us ears to hear, that you would soften our hearts to receive your word, that it might transform us and change us in those who we've been called to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Wayne. You may be seated. So today I want to talk about the sower, the seed, and the soil. The sower, the seed, and the soil. And then I want to share an application for this that I think lines up very well with what the Spirit of God has been doing uh, in our lives, in our city, and in our culture for the last several years that bears kind of an imminent uh, application for us. So there's a sower in the field. And as the crowd is gathering around Jesus, looking for more miracles, listening for more teaching, looking and listening for the surprises that this man is is bringing along in his ministry. And, And I believe that in this moment, Jesus is choosing to use a parable because he wants to make his word most acceptable, most approachable. So he tells a story. Isn't that what we do when we want somebody to understand what's happening? Isn't that how we teach children? Isn't that how we understand stories, is, or, 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 truths, is when we hear them through stories and then we find the application? 
And I believe that Jesus has, has this huge crowd following him. And, and, and he says, now there's a sower who is sowing the seed. He who has ears, let him hear. There was a sower sowing the seed. And I believe that Jesus was just pointing himself out and making it absolutely plain what he was doing. For anybody who was wondering, what was Jesus' priority during this time? He's saying there was, so hey, everybody, you came here to hear something really special. There was a sower sowing the seed. You tracking? He's like, I'm sowing something and I don't want you to miss what's happening because you might leave and realize you missed the whole thing. Have you ever been in a situation and you didn't realize the situation you were in until you left? Maybe, maybe you love celebrities and you met a celebrity not knowing they were a celebrity. You ever had that experience? And you walk away and you're like, oh, they were famous. I could have learned something or seen something or snapped a selfie. I could, have, I could have had something there, but I didn't understand the moment. I didn't understand how great it was. Have you ever had a great friendship that for a season of time was absolutely extraordinary and then you moved on and then only later did you realize, oh, I wish I had taken more advantage of the time that I had with that friend. It was so rich and powerful and wonderful. You ever been there? Jesus didn't want people to find out what happened at the end of his ministry and go, oh, I should have been paying attention. Which is so often the case with us, isn't it? Ah, oh, dang it, I should have been paying attention. So Jesus is saying, hey, y'all, pay attention. This is what I want you to know about the sower. The sower has a secret that he wants to share. Psalm 25 says that the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he will make known them his covenant, those who fear him. So he's looking for people who are going to pay attention and give reverence to him because he's got secrets that he wants to share. So what are these, what are these secrets? The word secret in the Bible and the word used here uh, in this passage about the, to you has been given the, the ability to understand secrets is, is this word mis that we get mystery from. But the word mystery to, to the ancient people of, of Greece and, Ju and, Jeru and Jerusalem, the, Ju the Jewish people, their understanding of a mystery was different than our understanding of a mystery. When we hear about mystery, it's something that we will never know. Right? Like, well, it's a mystery. What's past Pluto? It's a mystery. Is Pluto even a planet? Seems to be a mystery. Right? <laughs> it depends on when you were born, apparently. It's weird to do either of them. So, so, so what, you got is, what you got is Jesus saying, hey, I don't want you to miss this. I've got something that I want, you to tell, I want to tell you, and I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss this because there, there are ways that, that I've made the world to be. There are ways that I've orchestrated things to interact and behave with one another and within one another, and I don't want you to miss it. And I'll unpack more of that in just a moment, but that's why the sower sows the seed, which is the word. Because the word is, is, the full, is, is the best expression of God's intended outcome and intended purpose for things. All right, so this, so this sower has secrets that he wants to share. And I want to let you know, family, that there are things that God wants to share with you that he can't give you unless you press in a little bit. There are things about, the, about, about your life. There's things about the, the moment that we find ourselves in as a church in, in this city. There's things that God wants to speak to you about, about your family, about your relationships, that you'll never know unless you press in just a little bit. Unless you come a little bit closer. And, and the reality is, I say just a little bit, but what happens when you get in a little bit? You want to come in a little bit more. And when you get in a little bit more, you want to come in a little bit more because, because when, you, when God starts describing to you his heart for you, when God starts describing for you his heart for your people, when God starts describing for you his heart for the city, you're, it, it changes you and it makes you want to interact with that even, even more and to learn and know more. We learn that the sower is extremely generous. And so everybody in this, in this story would have understood the context for what was happening. A farmer was walking along his field, and generally a field would have an area that was well plowed and ready for the seed to be sown. And then there'd be a, a boundary, a, wa a rock boundary, where he, the, as rocks come up in the field, they put them over on the side, and it creates a boundary for the field, and so the rocks are there. And then among the rocks and just beyond the rocks are the thorns and thistles and weeds, the stuff that you don't want growing with your crops, Right? And so the, the farmer has to get around, and so, so he walks around to sow the seed and to take rocks out and everything else, and so he creates paths throughout his field so that he can get to places conveniently, but also so he doesn't mess up too much of the field. 
Okay, so, so that's how that, that path gets created. But when it's time to sow, the sower just starts sending the seed. He's just sending it. It's not like the technology that we have that, that's so exacting and sets everything in. They didn't have the, the lawn boy kind of seed distributor with the wheels and the spinner thing. So he had to walk out and with his hands or with a cup of some form, toss out the seed and he did so generously. And some of that seed was going to find really good soil. Some of that seed was going to fall where he had been walking on the hard path. Some was going to fall on the rocks and some was going to fall among the seed. But what I learned from that is that he's very generous with it. He didn't get stingy when he got up near the boundaries. He wasn't like, so much seed for you, good soil, and nothing for you, soil that's on the edge, because it might fall to the rocks or it might go to the seed, and God forbid that happen. So I'm going to withhold that and I'm going to give it to the people that I think are going to respond the best. God was sowing so generously that he sowed where it was going to bear the best, but he also sowed where it wasn't going to bear the best because he wanted everybody to have a chance to interact with the seed. You tracking? So the sower is very, very generous, and he didn't withhold even from the places where he knew that it wasn't going to do its best. And lastly, that he's got a goal in mind or a goal that he's been working towards. Everybody here would have known that a field doesn't make itself ready, but it's made ready by the sower. It's made ready by the owner. And he's made this field ready and prepared it to be able to receive the seed, and he's sowing the seed now because he expects a harvest to come from it. It wasn't a mystery. He wasn't sowing it and saying, well, we'll, we'll see what happens. He's sowing the seed so that it could grow up and it could bear fruit, and so that this process of sowing and reaping could continue forever. All right, so let's talk about the seed. We've got this seed. And Jesus describes it for us as the word of God. We see that the seed is the word of God. And that's incredibly helpful for us. Because otherwise, we could make the seed to be whatever we want the seed to be, right? You ever done that with a story? I remember, I remember in Mary Shelley, reading Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Probably sophomore, junior year of high school. And we started trying to guess what everything meant. And we were like making up wild versions of it. My, my English professor or teacher or whatever was, was pretty wild himself. And so he was just loving it. And he's like, yeah, why not? That's definitely about the robots taking over the world and AI. And he's like, oh, no, that's definitely about the, you know, the, the rough childhood that Mary Shelley had. Oh, that's definitely about her family that's been patched together and it's really strange. But somehow she's Frankenstein and the rest of us are the inventor and we're messing up her life. Yeah, but that sounds about right. Like, like I'm so thankful that Jesus describes it for us because we'd be like, well, the seed is obviously whatever I want it to be. And so Jesus is like, no, 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 the seed is the word of God. Let's make this clear. This is what's being sown by the sower. And this is, what, uh, this is what I've prepared the soil for. And the seed is the word of God. Now, the word word is an important word for these people. Now, we talked about this earlier this year, and you, you may not remember it. I, I, it's, it's, I don't blame you if you don't, but it's something. Like if I ever got a tattoo, it'd be probably logos. It'd be the word logos, which is the word word. And I'd get it so big. Probably after service, is that what you want? Yeah, just like on my throat probably is where I'd have to get it. The word, word, the word, word is amazing to them. For us, we refer to the word of God, meaning scripture, and we do it because that's what we heard somebody else call it, right? But when they talked about the word, word, the word logos, they knew in their culture, in Jewish culture, but also in Greek culture, there was a belief that there was a logos, there was a word from which everything came. And by which everything was being held together and to which everything was going. So the idea was that, that, that this word logos holds everything together. And now Jesus, every time he talks, every time Luke talks about Jesus sharing the word of God, he's talking about there's a logos, there's a, there's a word that God has, there's an idea from God, from which everything comes, by which everything hold, is held together, and to which everything is going. And so this is what Jesus is talking to them about. Wouldn't you just absolutely love to hear that? Like, Jesus, Jesus tell me where everything came from. And he's like, let's look at Genesis. Tell me who everything came from. Let's look at Genesis. And let me remind you right now, as the sower. Jesus, help us understand how everything's supposed to be held together. By the word of God. 
by the way that I've designed things. And so what we see in Scripture is sometimes we see a prohibition of something, and sometimes we see permission for something. And, and those, those align with the Word of God because he's saying, hey, I've designed this, this part of life to work a certain way, so, so don't withhold forgiveness from one another because it'll break relationships. I've designed you to relate to one another, but if you withhold forgiveness, then, then your relationships will fall apart because I've designed relationship to, to have forgiveness and, and, and uh, forgiveness and repentance as a necessary part of the human relation, relational uh, like, like way of being. But if you don't do that, it'll fall apart. If you, you're living out of sync with the word of God, the, things, the way you're living will be out of sync. All right, so when they use the word word, they're referring to this idea that we're from, what, from which everything comes. Okay, so that's the seed. The seed is the word of God. Now, the seed contains in it everything necessary to multiply, to supply, and to be grown again. The seed, everything in the little tiny seed, and, and, and if I was a better planner, I'd have just a little seed for us that you wouldn't be able to see from there anyway. And what we would do is we'd talk about how amazing it is that this little tiny seed has all the capacity in the world to grow up into a full-grown tree. The seed has all the capacity in the world. It has everything in it. There's nothing lacking from inside of that seed to become the fullest expression of itself. Seed's powerful. I read, I, was, I did kind of a nerdy deep dive on seeds, and I was like, I wonder how long seeds can last. And some seeds can last thousands of years. Which gives me hope. Because sometimes, because it, like just kind of using the, the analogy and pressing it a little bit, you realize that maybe a seed that was sown in your childhood could grow up and bear good fruit. Maybe a seed sown through that kind act by somebody at the grocery store could grow up and bear good fruit in your life. Gets me excited about seed. But it also means that other seed can be sown. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So even seeds that are thousands of years old can germinate and produce life. The only thing that the seed lacks is a place to grow into its fullness. Enter the soil. Y'all ready? This is what you read out loud. The soil is the heart. The, 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 the soil, it, what, what Jesus does is he describes three kinds of soil that were inconducive to growth and one kind of soil that he calls good. Now, I need to hasten to say, or I want to hasten to say, that even though he calls the good soil good, he doesn't call the other soils bad. And that's really helpful for me. Because I think sometimes as Christians, what, what happens in our heart and our mind is we see somebody, we see some rocky soil or we see some hard ground, and we call that person bad. They're bad. The word's not doing what it needs to do in their life. They're bad. They're, they, they don't behave in kind. They don't behave uh, lovingly. They don't, they, they, you don't see the character of Christ on their life. And, and so you're like, you're bad. But Jesus never calls them bad. He just says, that's not where it's going to grow. And I think sometimes the sower lets seed fall into those places and not grow into maturity to help us understand that maybe we're not where we thought we were. Okay, I'll, I'll describe that more. So the hard ground, he says that the hard ground falls, uh, the seed falls on the hard ground and the devil comes and snatches it up. Yes, the devil is real. No, we don't give him a lot of airtime. Yes, the devil hates God. I was watching the Lorax last night with my kids and, um, and, 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 and I got some really helpful theology from this, uh, from the Lorax. Um, um, Aloysius Supreme, or not Supreme, Aloysius, what is it Supreme? Aloysius, what's his face? Hates plants. He wants to sell oct. He wants to sell bottled air to everybody. And so, if people start planting, planting seeds and growing trees again, it screws up his plan because he wants people to be dependent on him. And so he's like, "No, no, 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 no! Let's not plant the seed. Just let it die." He sings a little song: "Let it die, let it die, let it shrivel up and die." Right. <laughs> And a song full of songs. That's the only song I remember. But, but Aloysius hates the seed because he knows that it's not just the seed, but in the seed is everything necessary that would transform the world. And the devil has the same hatred for the seed because if the seed would just find good ground and grow up, it would change the world. It'll change your life. My God, we go to alcohol and weed and all these other things. Oh, I'd say, you know, I stepped on weed feet. I'm sorry. But, 
But, but we go to drugs and we go to this and we go to that and we go to movies and we go to Instagram. We go to Insta, we go to, to, to YouTube shorts and to whatever else looking for something to numb the pain of life. And Jesus is like, I got some seed for you. I've got some seed for you. If it could just find some good ground, it'll grow up and bear good fruit. It'll change your life and it'll change the lives of everybody around you. Because that's the secret of the seed is it's not just for the seed. It's not just for the soil, but it's for the future. It's generational. I didn't plan on getting excited. That's not where I wanted to get excited. I didn't, yeah, yeah, I didn't, yeah. And then we got rocky soil. Rocky soil, the seed grows up quickly, and, but it dies under persecution. The sun comes out, it shines on it, and it wilts because it didn't have a root sufficient. You ever been there? Like, I, I think what's, what's amazing to me is I see myself in all of these soils. Anybody else? Man, the rocky one, you're like, oh, that was a good message. By the time you get to the door, maybe God spoke to you during worship. By the time you get to the door, you're ready to fight anybody who's in your way. You're like, I dare somebody to be in my way at Chipotle. I just had a good service, but I will fight you. Right? Like, I mean, we are wild with, 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 with this revelation. And it grows up fast, but it withers. It just gets pressed a little bit when you get cut off on 25. It weathers a little bit because you get tired or hungry. I mean, hangry. Just, my God. The revelation of God barely sustains my hangriness sometimes. I'm like, God, I, I just, I feel you calling me to love. I mean, Lindsay shared an amazing devotion this morning, pre-service. And she's like, we need to be consistent people. People of integrity. And we need to worship God with the kind of 1 Corinthians love that he has for us, even the people at our home. And I'm like, yes, Lord. But I know the devil is hiding at about 8.30 p.m. tonight. He's going to be like, get him. Is it 5 o'clock for you? Oh, 3 o'clock. Oh, 3, 3 in the afternoon. The rocky soil grows up fast, dies under persecution, dies under the first test, dies under the first trial, dies under the first pressure. Among the thorn, thorns grows for quite some time before the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke it out. Now hear me about the thorns. If you've been walking with Jesus for a little bit, this is the one that'll get you. This is the one that'll get you because you've got hard ground you don't even realize you've got because those other people have hard ground and you're a Christian. You're here on Sunday. You're doing so well. They're the hard ground. Them, those people. There's that phrase, those people. I get in trouble with that phrase. Those people are the hard ground. Those people are the rocky soil. But I'm in church, so I must be the good soil. Just even that statement reveals that you're getting choked out. Just even that thought reveals that the thorns are, 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 are squeezing in on you and squeezing out the life of righteousness. The fruit of peace, joy, perseverance. The fruit of love out of your life. Stephen, because those thoughts are there, reveals how much we can be choked by the thorns. Even, so like we, we get into Christianity and we start with gratitude and we're so excited. And we're like, oh man, I'm among the weeds, but, but man, I've got Jesus and this is amazing. And then the election cycle comes around. <laughs> the election cycle comes around and, and, and all of a sudden we're worried that they're not going to pick God's person. They, they're, they're, they're voting the wrong way. That's not God's person. God's person's that person, my person. Because I could not possibly miss it. You feel the, the thorns tighten. You feel tighten. And you feel the life leaving. And this one, this one doesn't all the way die. It just says it doesn't bear good fruit. So there's like, like, like uh, how does he say it? He says that, he's like, this one, this one's tricky. It's that they hear, they go on their way, they're choked by the cares and worries, and their fruit doesn't mature. But there's enough fruit for you to feel good about having some fruit. But it's not all the way to what it's supposed to be. But you feel real good about the fruit when you compare yourselves to the rocky ground and the hard path. Because you're like, well, the devil didn't get me. The persecution didn't get me. But I've got, I had this lemon tree. I got, I got Megan a lemon tree years ago. It's a Meyer lemon tree. So it was, a, it was a small lemon tree that had full-size lemons. It was really, I mean, the lemons, 
It, no, I, 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 no, I wasn't even going to talk about that. I killed it. I killed it. I, I am not a farmer, <laughs> not in my house, not in a field, not in a box, not whatever Dr. Seuss, I'm not, I'm not. I killed my wife's tree. I got it for her and then I killed it. But before I killed it, I tried to take good care of it. And what was amazing about this tree is that it had all of these leaves. And I was like, I'm the greatest farmer who's ever lived. And I was so proud of the leaves. And then like a year went by and I'm like, that's still a lot of leaves. I wonder when the lemons are gonna come. And so, so I start Googling it and they're like, if you've got this tree with so many leaves and no lemons, you need to cut some leaves off. And I was so happy about the leaves, I, but there was no actual fruit. There was no benefit to anybody. I was so happy. And so, so I very, I very if, if, with great amount of fear and trepidation, I started cutting the leaves off. So sad. I was so proud of the leaves. I started cutting them off. And then when it was done, I was like, I was like, oh, what a pathetic looking tree. It doesn't have any leaves. leaves are supposed, trees are supposed to have leaves, but lemon trees are supposed to have lemons. And so I had to cut off the leaves so that it would grow lemons. And, and, and certainly the, the buds started showing up. And then, and then, and then you got to pollinate it. So I pollinate it. And then the little lemons were there. And the lemons started growing. They started turning yellow. And now I didn't just have the green leaves. I had some lemons on there too. And I was really, really happy. Sometimes God wants to cut the, the green leaves of your tree off so that you can have some lemons. But here's the thing. I started having lemons. And the lemons were growing. And I was so excited about these lemons. I was like, I am the greatest farmer who's ever lived times two. I... There is no greater farmer in the world than me. What great things will we make from these lemons? I was, I, pies, I was thinking lemonade stands. I, we had a, we had a franchise. We were, we, it was going to be amazing. We were going to run the neighborhood with lemonade stands. But the thing is, the thing is that the, I didn't, I didn't have enough of the, the, the right stuff in the soil. I, it wasn't deep enough. So the soil, it wasn't, it wasn't deep enough, but it was deep enough for other things to start growing. And I thought, I've got an ecosystem. I'm a great farmer. Look, I'm even growing other things. Like, who else could grow other things with their lemon tree? But the other things were competing for the lemon's wow. nutrients. Wow. And so the lemons stayed small. So what did I have to do? Again, I had to go in and I had to take out the stuff that I was liking for something that was better. I had to kill these little plants. I killed them, murdered them. Just. <laughs> but I, I, I wish I could be like, but I was so hard I didn't even. Like I, I, my heart was so soft in that way. I was like, oh man, they're going to die. Maybe I could plant them somewhere else. But they grew up inside. They're not going to grow anywhere else. And yeah, not in my clay yard of, of Virginia at the time. So. So are you seeing where I'm going? Okay. A note about seeds. In Matthew 25, Jesus warns, because so the seed can be sown among the seed, but I think that we also need to be aware that, that there's an enemy who can sow seeds as well. And there's a, there, this is most likely talking about the wheat harvest, the, the, the wheat seeds and the wheat harvest. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a plant that looks an awful lot like wheat. It's called tares. And when it grows up, it looks almost identical to tares. And so Jesus said, sometimes what happens when you've got an enemy that doesn't like you, you go and you sow your wheat field with wheat seeds, and your enemy is going to come in, and he's going to sow tare seeds um, alongside of your wheat seeds. And so as it grows up, you're not going to know the difference between them. But you're going to know that there's weed, but you're not going to know which one's which. And that's a dangerous place to be. And so I think that, he, so Jesus warns, he, he's saying, hey, just, just be aware that as seed is being sown, there's one who hates you who also wants to sow bad seed. And, and, and I, family, I, just, I think we've got to be aware that not only can the seed fall, um, can, not only can the seed of the word of God fall among the thorns, the enemy wants to sow bad seeds along with the good seed to bring about confusion and the confusion could be, could be of, of many different kinds. The confusion could be uh, as, as, as simple as individual calling. It could be something as broad as a, a denomination getting drawn off course because bad seed was sown among them and you couldn't tell the difference between it. Now, here's the thing about tares. If you eat tares, it, it'll make you sick. 
It'll make you sick. So while it looks the same for most of the process, it'll, it'll make you sick. And that's why the enemy does. He's going to destroy your crop. But at the very end, when it's time for the harvest, there's a difference between the wheat and the tares. Wheat bows down. Church people are like, yeah, preach it. You already preached the message. I'm not even going to say it as well as you did in your heart, Heather. <laughs> the wheat at the time of harvest, is bowed down. It takes a position of humility because of the weight of the fruit on its life. The tares stand straight up, proud of itself. So proud of itself. And that's how we know the difference between it. Sometimes, sometimes you don't know. Sometimes I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know in my life sometimes which thing was God and which thing was the enemy until it has a little bit of time to grow up and then I see which one worships and which one doesn't. Mm, come on. When two things are sown at the same time, you've got a destiny and a calling and a purpose. I believe that was from God, but in there there's some stuff that's sown that kind of messes it up. Now, now, how do I know which one? The one that's sown by God, the one that is sown that is the word of God is going to bow down to God. It's going to walk in humility. It's going to walk with repentance. But the one, the, the tares among it's going to be like, no, nah, I'm the freaking man. Yeah, come on, come on. You tracking for yourself? Okay. So let's talk about the good soil. Now, let me, say this about, <laughs> let me say this about the good soil. Some of the place where we expect, let me, let, me, let me say it this way. Sometimes we're quick to call bad soil, or sometimes we're quick to call good soil bad soil because of how it looks or how it smells or how it feels. But it's exactly the soil that Jesus is looking for. Look at the people who Jesus was bringing along with him. He was throwing parties with tax collectors. He was hanging out with the Pharisees. He was hanging out with, with people who were really far from God. He was, he was drawing close to people who were demon-possessed. He was laying hands on dead people, otherwise making himself unclean if they didn't just keep coming to life every time he touched them. <laughs> Oftentimes what we cast off as bad soil, Jesus is saying, no, no, that's the soil that I want, and that's exactly where I want my seed to go which is why revivals often take times in prison. I take, take place in prison. Revivals take place in prison all the time because, because where we all see damaged people and real problem people and everything else, Jesus goes, oh, that looks like some soil that's been roughed up that's ready for some seed. That looks like some people who are ready for some seed. That person that you don't like who's been through a difficult time, maybe they're ready for some seed. All right. The good soil receives the seed. It holds the seed and then contains the seed long enough patiently so that it can grow up and bear good fruit. I planted some, some flowers with Emma this, this spring. I got it in the ground late. I didn't read the packets. Because I'm the best farmer who's ever lived. Who reads packets? I just saw the pretty pictures on the front of them. I was like, oh, these are going to, we're going to have the best garden in the neighborhood. So we threw them in there, and uh, we just got our first one, like, <laughs> last Friday. <laughs> this one, this one, it's, it's just a little stem and a purple puff. It's about this big, and it's going to die tonight because it's going to be cold. But I'll tell you, if I didn't go outside every morning all summer long, May, June, July, by the time I got to August, I had a bad attitude. I stopped doing it. But I was watering. I was like, these are stupid broken seeds. Like, they're selling bad seeds. What a, what a, what a scam. They're selling bad seed to us. And, and they said it's going to be in the ground so long. So they, what, what are they going to say? Be like, no, no, just be patient. Like, we'll just wait for it. And then by the time they were like, I come around, and I'm just going to buy new seed. But really, so I went back and I looked at the packets because I kept them because that's what good farmers do. <laughs> and it said like, it said like germination was like three and a half months. And it said, you need to start it inside if you live in Colorado. <laughs> I was like, 
those are dumb flowers. Why are we selling them here? What are we, what are we, who, why are we even selling these flowers here if they can't grow? I was so mad. Self-righteous. Standing straight up like a tear. But the, but the, but the seed, it, I, I wasn't patient. I wasn't patient. I went out every day. I watered it, watching it. Like, where is it? And then I saw a little bit of green. I'm like, it's there. It's awesome. Now, come on, turn purple or green or all the colors. I mean, it was, it was going to be amazing. Maybe next year. If, I don't even know if they're annual, annuals or perennials, which is gardener, farmer speak for, it's on the packet. That was a test. Good farmers just look at the pictures. It's on the packet. Man, there's probably a sermon in there, too. <laughs> that's its own, that's its own sermon. We're going to make this a series. So the good soil holds it patiently and allows for it to grow up into its fullness. And if you're not patient with it, you risk walking away from it. You risk not watering it anymore because it's not doing what you expected it to do. You risk not creating the right environment for it anymore because you're afraid that maybe something wrong has happened. That, that maybe, maybe the seed of the word of God isn't actually sufficient to grow up and bear good fruit because I haven't gotten that promotion. Maybe, it, it, maybe, the, the, the word, maybe the seed's not good enough or worse, maybe oftentimes what we do is we either go like, maybe I'm not good enough or maybe God's not good enough, but something here is not good enough. And and because we're just not patient enough for God to have his way in us. All right, so the good soil, it holds and every patiently for it to grow all the way into maturity. And everybody there would have known that it takes so much work to maintain good soil. It takes so much work to maintain good soil. Anybody ever kept a garden not in a planter box? Yeah, it takes, it takes work, doesn't it? Because when the ground freezes, it pushes rocks to the surface. And so new rocks surface every year. The colder the environment, the harsher that is, the more likely it is that they're going to come out. So the farmers would have to go out and they'd pick up the rocks and they walk them out of the good soil and they set them on the side and it becomes a boundary line, almost as is to say, no, that's something that doesn't belong in here anymore. That's the boundary line. That's where I'm drawing the boundary on my life because I want to keep this soil good. I'm not going to go to this place. You tracking? I got to take the rock out and set it over there so that I can be good soil. And, and the, other thing about, the other thing about soil is that other things want to grow there. And so you got to constantly, at the right times of year, be pulling stuff out. If you pull it out during harvest, it messes it up. That has to do with tares and wheat. You, you Google it. And, and so, so, what you, so what you have, what you have is, is the constant maintenance of the soil in order to maintain that it's always, in order to keep it good. Have you tried growing grass here? God, it's the worst. Grass is not supposed to be here. It's just, it's just not supposed to be here. But everybody in my neighborhood insists on having grass. So what do we do? We've got to drive machines over it to pull out plugs of grass so that the roots can breathe. Instead of just acknowledging, like, it's the wrong dirt, bro. Like, it's the wrong dirt. It's the wrong plant. It's the wrong plant and the wrong dirt. And then you've got to, you've got to pay to, like, have the chemicals put into it. You're managing complexes. You do this at, like, large scale. And you're just, like, constantly feeding it. And, like, like there are places where grass just likes to grow. And there are places where it doesn't want to grow at all. Colorado is one of those places. Denver is one of those places. Just zero escape that sucker. This is a counseling couch for me this morning. What? Switch to rocks. I could plant some rocks. I keep them alive too. Just so, so everybody knows how much work it would have taken, and, and maybe you know how much work it takes to keep yours clean, but sometimes what we do is we just, we just get lazy, and we're like, no, 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 that rock won't cause a problem. That rock won't cause, I, I won't forgive that person, and then we get comfortable with the unforgiveness rock in our garden, and then, and then what happens is the, the unforgiveness rocks start multiplying, because, because I didn't forgive that person, and that rock didn't destroy the operation. So I'm not going to forgive that person either. And so that, you're not, now it's not destroying the operation. Before you know it, you've got a gravel lot and nothing's growing anymore. Wow. And I use unforgiveness today, but, but all kinds of rocks can enter our garden. Yes. And I think that's unique to every single one of us. So what do, you, what do we do with this? Um, I 
I think, I think this morning God is, God is helping us see today that maybe you, maybe, oh, the last thing the good soil does is it holds it long enough for the fruit, for the seed to multiply. That's big time. Because it's not just for itself anymore. Sometimes we get just enough Jesus to be good enough for just us. But the good soil produces the environment that makes enough for others as well. Okay. I believe the last three years, God has been revealing hard, rocky, and weedy soil so that so that healing could come to it. I believe that some of the difficulty that you have faced as individuals, much of the difficulty that's been faced by the church, and the difficulty that's been faced in our culture was simply the farmer saying, there's a problem, and I want to make that bad soil good. And it's been the plow of God going into the hard soil and breaking it up. It's been the farmer going and taking out rocks that, that, that at one time we knew they were problematic, but now we've come to love and we can't imagine life without that rock. And he's been taking the rocks out and he's saying, no, 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 I'm moving this rock to the boundary line because I want you, soil, to be good. I believe that he's been exposing ways that... that uh, that the weeds and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches has been choking out not just the world, but his people, yes. the church. I mean, how many of our own thoughts constantly turn to the elections and to inflation and recession and, and the job market and all these other cares and all these other concerns instead of trusting our God in the midst of it? There's this amazing cooperation that God invites us into where we work to prepare the soil of our hearts, but he comes in and does it as well. So if you've felt the difficulty of the last couple of years, of the last few years, or you've seen it from a distance and you've been wondering, what the heck is going on with the church? What the heck is going on with our culture? What is, what is happening here? I believe that it was just God preparing good soil. Just preparing good soil. Good soil has manure in it. It does. Good soil's got some mess in it. it stinks a little bit. You're like, it couldn't be good soil. It stinks. Might be the best. He's been pulling out rocks and creating boundary lines. He's been separating the, the tares from the wheat. He's been preparing the seed. The seed in some of us is beginning to grow up into maturity, and we're seeing it, and we're feeling it. And if that's you, if you feel the maturing of the seed, it's time for you to join the sower. With the same generosity, the same hospitality, the same faithfulness of the sower to join him in the work of sowing. The seed isn't just for the soil that soil. The seed is for other soil as well. 